I've got a couple of uh, prayer requests that have come in. Uh, many of you that have been with us many years know Dr. Jim Bertel out of Little Rock, Arkansas, a, a great friend of this church. Uh, he fell this morning and broke his kneecap. So the family's requested prayer for him. Uh, also, uh, Dale, he's got a lot of problems. We've been praying for Dale a pretty good while. And he has COVID on top of everything else that he has and really needs our prayers. And, of course, John Dyer, still in the hospital, uh, he will have, this next week, he will have uh, some pre procedures done on his heart. And uh, they can't do a lot because he's still not in good, stable condition. But they've got to go in and take a look. And so John Dyer, this next week, will have some heart procedures for them to get a good look at what's going on. So those are our three requests that have come in this morning for us to pray about. And so we'll do that. We'll get a chance for everybody to get seated. And then we'll have prayer. Remember the procedure for Bible study. Confession of sin that allows the Holy Spirit to be in charge of teach and recall of your life like in John 14, 26. So we want to be sure that mental attitude, sins, sins of the time of work, sins are confessed prior to study. Uh, so that's important. So that's a first John 1 9. If we confess our sins, faith and just forgive us and cleanse us. So go ahead, let's go ahead and do that procedure, and then I'll have prayer for these prayer requests that have come in, and then we'll introduce the Eucharist this morning. We'll be doing a little paperwork. So let's pray. So, Father, we come to you today uh, with prayer requests. We have some within ourselves that I, I'm confident we prayed part of my prayer here of the public prayer. But we do pray for Jim Bertel, Father, that uh, you do a good healing on him and, uh, and uh, the medical staff that will take charge of this responsibility will be good. We pray for Dale. Amidst all of the enormous problems this man has physically, uh, you, uh, you tack on COVID. And so some great things are in store for him, Father, and I hope he can keep the spirit of the grace of God working in his life to reach out to other people that need to be comforted by someone in suffering. Sometimes we get so caught up in our own suffering that we miss opportunities to help others in suffering. I pray for that for him. And for John Dyer, I lift him before your father and I pray for great healing. I pray that when they get in, they're going to take a look and it's already been healed. That would be my prayer. And... Uh, if not, then, Father, we, we know it's the plan of God and the will of God for John just to keep on trucking on at the hospital ministry. And we're excited about that. I pray today, Father, as we look at the Eucharist, what a, an enormous event this is in the life of the church. In this life of this church, the first Sunday of every month. And so we look at, Father, the fundamentals of it today before we participate in it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh huh. Will we, will we identify this as a suicide attempt? I mean, wow. 
that's a sure enough shot in it as a rule. Then God has something for him. And if not for him, a whole lot of people around him, huh? But we'll share. Well, let's just pause for a moment on that deal. Wow. There's nothing worse for a family to have to deal with than suicide. There's nothing worse. Wow. That's, they're, they're the worst I've ever pastored with. They're, they're terrible to have to deal with within a family. So I'm going to ask, let's offer this prayer. You probably have more insight to it. If you have your Bibles open to the Eucharist passage of 1 Corinthians 11. This is uh, probably the most famous Eucharist passage uh, for the church. Uh, Jesus dealt with it in Luke 22 as a Passover meal. And Paul deals with it as a wonderful ordinance of the church. And there are two elements, and I want to talk about that uh, first in the morning, and I I want you to do a little paperwork with me. Verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was prayed to a bread, that takes you back to Luke 22 in reference, uh, or maybe Matthew, 26. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you, does and remembrance of me. So he emphasizes with the bread, he emphasized his body. In verse 25, in the same way with thanksgiving, he took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me. So I want us to really focus in on that. So on your paper, I want you to write that. I want you to put that on your paper. We emphasize three points. All right? So he says, the body and the blood. The body and the blood. All of it deals with the cross. The body and the blood. Oh, that's right there. The body and the blood. I want to show you something that that's important to your life and mine. All right. Thank you. This is the this is preparation for this. When you're looking at the body, I want you to go to First Peter two twenty four. First Peter two twenty four about the body. This talking about the body of Jesus Christ. This is. Jesus on the cross, there's his body and his blood. The body and the blood are essential for the Eucharist. And there are a lot of passages. I'm just going to pull out one on each of these issues. Uh, Here's the body one, and we'll come to the blood one in a moment. It says in 1 Peter 2.24, if you're looking at your Bible, uh, from the New American Standard, 
he himself bore our sins in his body. Whose, whose sins? Ours. Our sins. That's the sins of the human race. Now, when it becomes personal, it's because we've accepted the gospel. We've accepted the fact that he died for my sins. I believe that. Now I'm saved. He himself, that means he alone. He alone. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. In order to do that, there are some things that he is required of him. First of all, he has to be virgin born. He has to be a lamb without blemish and spot. There can be no growth, there can be no birth defects nor growth defects to be the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world, John 1.29. Right? So he's got to be that lamb. It could be no birth defects because a lamb could be offered as a sacrifice for sin in shadow Christology if they had any birth defects or growth defects. So that takes virgin birth. It also takes an impeccability. Impeccability. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You realize the moment you get you believe the gospel of Christ, that the moment you believe in the gospel of Christ, the the righteousness of God is transferred through Jesus to your life. Now think about that. The righteousness of God is transferred through Jesus Christ to your personal life. That's an enormous idea. That's why you can't lose your salvation. You can lose the joy of it, but you can't lose the experience of it. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins and was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, you're going you're to receive the righteousness of God through Christ. That's positional righteousness. When you believe it, you receive it. Right? So this is an enormous statement. We come to the Eucharist today because we honor the body of Jesus Christ that was born outside, out, born outside the slave market of Adam's sin where the rest of us are born. Every human being is born inside Adam's sin, it, born inside the slave market of sin. Every human being, with the exception of one. That's Jesus Christ, let's conceive of the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary. That created Jesus being born, created, born outside uh, the, the sin nature of man, that old sin nature, and as well as the Adam's original sin. But, so this whole passage right here is pushing this idea. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that, here's the divine results of that, so that we those who believe in Christ, might die to sin and live to righteousness. Can you live to righteousness? Yes. you got it at salvation. You don't have to come up with it. You already have it. You just got to exercise it. Do the right things that God tells you to do. Do the right things. Do the things according to the will of God, and things are going to go well with your life in the plan of God. That we might die to sin, that he bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin, that sin nature, and live in the power of the Holy Spirit, to live the righteous life. For by his wounds you were healed. He's talking about salvation here. That's a strong salvation passage. Right? So, there's two, two aspects of this. Christ has to be born outside Adam's sin. Listen, there is one sin, there is one sin that puts every man in need of salvation. There's one sin that puts every man in need of salvation. Do you know what that one sin is? Adam. Adam's original sin. Adam's original sin, one sin that puts everybody in need of salvation. 
every human being has, is under 13 judicial charges. He, he is born alienated from God. He is in darkness, uh, in death. He's under the curse. He's condemned. He's blind. Right? He, he, he's perishing. He's a sinner. He's unrighteous. He's ungodly. He's under the wrath of God. All these 13 judicial charges in that little pamphlet, 50 things that you receive at salvation, you could, you know, that's removed and all of that. But you really need to understand. So when we come today, we celebrate the fact we honor the body aspect. The body of Christ bore my sins. And not only, listen, not only Adam's sin did he die for, but he, he died to eliminate the old sin nature through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit and personal sin. That's the three categories. When he died that one death on that cross, he took care of the big sin. That's Adam's sin. Romans 5, 12 through 21 tells you that. Wherefore, if by one man Adam sin in the world of death by sin. And so the death, the sin death passed upon all mankind. And he goes on to explain it. This is also 1 Corinthians 15, 22. And Adam all die, and Christ are all made alive. So when we look at the Eucharist, we're looking at the aspect of the body of Christ that not only did it take care of old sin nature, but it gives us through the resurrection, the indwelling Holy Spirit to control the old sin nature we have till we die, and personal sin. So when the Bible says, well, he died, he, he bore all of our sins, that's absolutely true. But the one that puts men out of the circuit circle, the one that is Adam said, we're forced by one man, Adam. It's not your personal sin. It's your Adamic sin. Personal sin is an issue to a believer. It's not an issue to an unbeliever. How's he going to stop any of that? He don't have the Holy Spirit. He's controlled by the flesh. He runs wild with the flesh. That's, a, that's an unbeliever. And the only thing that can control that anywhere at all is either morality or religion. And they don't do anything about salvation. Well, I live by the Ten Commandments. Right? Then it will prove you're a sinner in need of a Savior. That's what the law does. It points you to Christ. It shows you you have a great need that can't be met apart from the gospel of Christ. You really need to understand that. If you think you're going to go to heaven because you're religious or you're moral, you're wrong. You're going to go because Christ is the only one that has resolved Adamic's, Adam's original sin. When you believe it, that sin is done with forever. You still have an old sin nature that can be only controlled by the indwelling Holy Spirit, and you have personal sin that has to be confessed in order to be back with the Spiritual ministry of the Holy Spirit. First John 1 now. Well, I'm telling you, people, you've got to get this. You have got to get this information. So when we take part in the celebration of the cup, uh, uh, of, the, of the bread, we're looking at the work of Christ on the cross for our salvation, and not only our salvation, as far as Adam said, but through the death, burial, and resurrection, we're looking at the power over the sin nature. It's unacceptable that you can't beat the, your lust in the flesh. It's unacceptable. Well, I have an anger problem. You know, I have red hair. Now, you have red hair, but that's not why you're angry all the time. Because you have a sin nature, and you're not looking for a supernatural power over it. The indwelling Holy Spirit controls the sin nature by your choice. He doesn't do it automatically. He does it because you, you surrender to it. It's the only power over your sin nature. It's the only power over your sin nature. You can't do it once a week. You have to do it all the time. You, you don't understand this stuff. So there, that, there's that point of this whole thing. That's, that's point number, the first point. The second point is the blood, right? Now, there's more to this, and there's more to just these two ideas here on the body. He's, but 
impeccable and birds of birth at the, at the keys. All right? And who you are in Christ is going to come by his resurrection. The second thing that he talks about in the Eucharist is the blood. The blood. We're not talking, we're not talking physical. We're not talking physical blood. We're talking spiritual. This is spiritual language. We're not talking about a, just a typical body, are we? And we're not talking about a typical blood. This is a blood that's, this is, listen, let me tell you who that blood is before it's hung on the cross. That's the blood of God. This is the only begotten Son of God, and the blood in him is pure blood. You understand that? It's not tainted by Adam's sin. It doesn't, listen, the blood of Christ doesn't get tainted until he dies on the cross. And then it's called for. The blood of Christ is called for in the hour of atonement. The high priest went to the temple in the, in the great moment of atonement. It is only then when he has finished paying the price with his own life blood, with his own life blood, that he says, Father, your work is finished. The teleastai in the perfect tense. The work of the cross is now done for all of mankind to come into the program of salvation by grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourself, is a gift of God, not of works, least any man boast. The blood has to be divine when it's offered. It has to be by the rules of God. The blood has to be according to the will of God. It was true in the animal world of sacrifice. It is true in the world of Christ on the cross. And when he gives up his blood, he gives up the blood of his relationship with God Almighty. And he hangs on the cross as the atoning work for all sin mankind. It's an enormous gift. That's what, why salvation is a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith and God. It's a gift. It's a gift from God to you. It's a gift from Jesus to you. This you're not going to have to do on your own. You could not do it on your own. And so, I have a passage on this one for blood. Let's go to Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 12. I'm not giving a whole lot of passages, although there's a lot. And this one is going to jive, this one is going to jive with John 1.29. Behold, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. Jesus comes, John declares, the prophet John declares, Behold, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. Now, in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 12, in the New American Standard, here's what it says. Salvation does not come through the blood of goats and calves anymore, shadow Christology, but through his own blood. That's the blood of Christ. That's the blood of the Messiah. In the Old Testament, it was the blood of, of goats and calves born without birth defects and growth and offered without growth defects, no defective animals. And it was to point towards the coming of the Son of God who would offer the righteous blood of God. for the sin of Adam. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place. He entered the holy place. That's the high priest in atonement. Offer. Watch this all. Watch this now. In that passage, once for all. You know who the all is? Once 
once for all. See, we use that phrase and we stick them together, don't we? Well, I've told you once for all. Well, maybe not. He entered the holy place once for all. In other words, there's not going to be any other atoning work for salvation. There's no no more. This is one act, and it is for all time and for all people. Having obtained, watch this now. He enters the holy place once once for all. Watch this now. Having obtained eternal redemption. That's why it's given to you as a gift. It's given to you as a gift. When he was through paying that price, it it was. He earned eternal redemption. And it's offered to you as a gift from him to you. It's a gift. You don't earn it to get it. You don't earn it to keep it. It's a gift of God's marvelous grace. We take part in the Eucharist because we understand the bread is the body of Christ and we understand the cup is the blood of Christ. It was a, it's holy blood that is offered for the sins of mankind. It is the blood of the very Son of God. Well, that's really important. That is really important. You see, you want to draw a line through that. This is Christ dies on a cross. He's buried and then he's raised from the dead. You see, when you got the cross part, you have the death of Christ. All about the death. Required, and that's going to require the body and the blood. The body and the blood. I know. The body and the blood. I, I get. I didn't get through at the third grade. Give me a break. It's all about the death, isn't it? Death. It's all about the death. His his final words from the cross. It's tetelestai. In the perfect tense, it is finished. The work of salvation is finished, Father. And then you know what he does? He goes right to heaven, right? Mm-hmm. No. He is buried. For three days, he's buried. And on the third day, he's raised from the dead. You know what that section is all about? Life. That's all about life. We live in the power of his life. We're saved in the power of his death, but we live in the power of his life. We're saved in the power of his death, but we live in the power of his life. After 40 days, he goes back and he's ascended to the Father, to the right hand of God, the Father in heaven. And he sends back the Holy Spirit who gives us the third member of the Godhead who lives inside our body. And that's where the the spiritual life exists in every human being that believes the gospel. This This is really good, powerful stuff. You really do need to understand this when you take part in the Eucharist. You need to understand this stuff. Jesus saves you from sin. The Holy Spirit keeps you from engaging in it. You didn't write that down. Apparently you know it. If you didn't know that, you ought to write it down. If you did know it, then it's already part of your modus operandi. The Holy Spirit gives you power to live the Christian life. You can't live it in the flesh. You don't have to live it in the flesh. You don't have to live a defeated life. You can live a successful life. You should never be in bondage to anybody but Jesus Christ. You should be in bondage to no, nothing but Jesus Christ. Nobody has given you what he's given you. For your life. Not just for your 
Not just for your death, but for your life. You, God, are really understanding this stuff. This is elementary stuff. I'm not telling you anything fancy here. I'm just giving you pure out gospel stuff. You've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, not only for Adamic sin that has locked you into the 13 judicial charges, alienated from God. These are positional. All of those are positional. You say, well, I never felt hostile to God. You don't have to be. You're born in it. These are all positional. Well, I don't think I'm perishing. Well, you would if you had birthdays. But, of course, perishing is much more than that. It shows us that we're in a, a, a physical, mental, and spiritual decline in our life. Where'd that come from? Adam's sin. I mean, everything ages. You got a chicken, it ages. You got a cat, it ages. You got a person. We all age. That's due to Adam's sin. Trees, flowers. They will die. Why? Well, it's a cycle of life. Well, what, who creates a cycle of life? Um, where'd that come from? You know, from the Bible, we know. We know where it comes from. So, you want to be sure that you got Romans 5, 12 through 21 on that paper. You got, you got to be sure you know that. Listen to Romans 5, 16. I pulled out one passage. Now, I expect you, I expect you, you wrote down Romans 5, 12 through 21. I expect you to do what today? Sometime this week. What? Study. Not just read. I want you to study it. You will find more information in that stuff than you could possibly imagine. You write, should write down all the things you got in Adam and all the things that have been removed in Christ. That would be a wonderful study. I pulled out verse 16 just to tease you a little bit with it. Listen to this. On the one hand, the judgment arose from one man's transgression. The key word for you is judgment. That's a key word. Did you write that down? You're making me nervous. You're trying to sell me that you got all this down and under the belt. And I'm going, I don't think so. Judgment. Judgment. On the one hand, the judgment arose from the one transgression. Judgment. Resulting in condemnation. That's another key word. But on the other hand, see, this is what you are in Adam, but this is what you are in Christ. On the one hand, in Adam, you're under the judgment and the condemnation. But on the other hand, in Christ, right? Here's one of Willie's favorite passages. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. If you hear Willie teach, he's going to get to that. In Adam, all die. In Christ, all are made alive. Just that simple. On the one hand, in Adam, you're under judgment and condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift, grace, arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. See, on the one hand, you got judgment and condemnation, but on the other hand, in Christ, you have justification. It's a gift. Not only is it a gift, listen, he made sure you didn't miss it. He called it a free gift. He called it a free gift, just in case you didn't understand grace. On the one hand, in Adam, you have judgment and condemnation. On the other hand, in Christ, you have the free gift, that arose from any transgression resulting in justification. So, let's take a look. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11. Let's do the Eucharist. I feel like maybe we have a little bit better understanding about the, the body, the bread, the blood and the cup. 
Paul says, I've, re- I've received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. I feel the same way. That the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took, that is by giving thanks, he took the cup. He said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Notice that in each one of these, the key word is remembrance. Did you get that? Remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me, the bread. Do this in remembrance of me, the blood. You're connected with both the body of Christ and the blood of Christ in the Eucharist through your salvation. For as often as you eat, verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I tell you what, isn't that interesting? We do the Eucharist until he comes, right? I, I've always thought, wouldn't it be interesting coming at the time of the Eucharist? Wouldn't that be me? A toast to you, Lord. Whoop. That'd be too good, wouldn't it? Well, we all have our own dreams. In verse 27, he says, Therefore, if you have a therefore, what do you have? Why for? Right? You always have, if there's a therefore, you always ask why for, and that would go back to the beginning of this, of what we started here, the Eucharist, right? Where he talks about the two elements, agreed? Therefore, having a good understanding of the two elements, the body and the blood of Christ, therefore, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that is sin, because that's why he came and died, right? The, the body and the blood is all about the sin offering, agree? Oh, thank you. This, in an unworthy manner, that would be personal sin in your life as a believer, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. In other words, the Holy Spirit has you caught here, and you should do what? You ought to 1 John 1 9. Thank you. You ought to 1 John 1 9. You need to confess that sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of tongue, or word sins. It needs to be confessed before you take part in the Eucharist. It should be a, a joyful occasion, yet a solemn occasion, would you agree? I mean, we're, we're both at a, a birthday for, for you and a funeral for him. The Eucharist is about your birthday and it's about his funeral. Oh. A man must examine himself, 1 John 1 9, and in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. There's reason for no believer in this congregation not take part in the Eucharist, but in order to participate, you got to make sure you have no unconfessed sin, right? That's unworthy. He who eats, eats and drinks judgments to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. And he goes on to explain, for this reason, divine discipline, many among you are weak, sick, and a number sleep. It's a euphemism for dying. dying. If we judge ourselves rightly, how would we do that? First John 1, 9. We would not be judged, but when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Right? We, we, are, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Be sure you run that test on yourself all the time. Monday, test yourself. Tuesday, test yourself. Wednesday, <laughs> are you in the world or are you of the world? All right, well, let's take part in the Eucharist. I'm going to ask the gentleman to come forward. Rick. Father, it just thrills my soul that this is the work for us to have salvation is already done. And we're still mm-hmm. going and hanging on that cross in our place that we may have the hope and assurance of our salvation and eternal life. I thank you for this and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.
And when he broke it and gave thanks, he said, this is my body, which is for you to do this remembrance of me. William? Well, Heavenly Father, I said this for this morning, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for you for this morning. I thank you once again for how you gave this gift to your son, Jesus, and his blood, Jesus, that we might be all saved in one day before you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. You're so good to us and so loving to us. We ask this in Jesus' name and we pray. Hmm. After giving thanks, he said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me. We're going to go ahead and take the offering. Well, as you as you see by the clock, you hold your lesson for next week. I'm going to talk about citizens of heaven. But I've ran out of time today because I felt really led this morning to really get after the Eucharist that we might have a better understanding of the importance of it. And uh, almost, well, all, all New Covenant doctrines flow from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The whole Eucharist is all about the gospel of Christ and every doctrine of the New Covenant flows from it. There's not one that we don't have that don't flow from it. You really need to understand the Eucharist. <laughs> so, <clears throat> next time, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at the end of chapter of the book of Philippians and what it, what it, what it, what it, in, what involved, what is involved in citizenship in heaven. What, what will heaven be like? And what is the fact that we're citizens? You know, most of the time I was just glad that the idea that I would get to go to heaven but to actually be a citizen. And one of the things you want to pay attention to, that you've got a whole week to look at this, is that you have dual citizenship. Every, every born-again American has dual, at least dual. You, you, you're an American, you have citizenship here. And if you're a believer, you have citizen, you're already a citizen in heaven. You know why? Because your name is written in the in the enrollment book of heaven. The book of life is, is all about heaven. If your name is there, you get to go there. And when you, one of the things you're going to do there is be a citizen. You're going to be a citizen of heaven. And you'll have a trial run down here in the millennial age. It's just kind of interesting. Well, I'm going to, let's go ahead and uh, take a break. Coffee and donuts downstairs uh, or something. And then we'll come back and Jeff will bring our second lesson.